I'm Brian McGonigal, Manager of Alumni Community Engagement for SEBS and the New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station. I'd like to welcome everyone here for our very first SEBS <laughs> Science Cafe event. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, please note everyone's microphones will remain muted during the presentation to avoid any distracting background noise. We ask that you use the chat feature to submit any questions as press them to, uh, to make sure we see them. If we have a follow-up question, uh, we will be able to meet you. This event will also be recorded and stored online for viewing after the event. After the event, uh, we have a great program lined up for you uh, with Oscar Schofield, our professor and chair. So right now, I'd like to pass the mic over to the director of the Science Cafe program, uh, Dr. Mary Nucci. Mary Thank you, Paul, in court. Thank, thank you, Brian, and uh, thank you in advance, Oscar, for joining us today. So, everyone, welcome to this is our fourth year of SEB's Science Cafes. Um, obviously, we're virtual this year, which makes it a little more exciting because we can see a few more of you, or actually have a few more of you attend. Science Cafes are an opportunity to have an informal conversation with a scientist. So for those of you who are students, you're not getting a lecture. This is a conversation. So please jump in if you have any questions about anything that you're going to hear or just some questions for Dr. Schofield. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our speaker today. And Dr. Schofield is Distinguished Press Professor and Department Chair of the Department of Marine and Coastal Sciences. He is a biological oceanographer and has conducted research in a range of oceans around the world. He's also part of the Center for Ocean Observing Leadership, the Cool Room. Some of you may have heard of that, and that is, this is the professor you want to ask questions about that. And the Cool Room develops, and the Cool Program actually develops new technologies and the sensor network to better document and model the marine system to help us understand what is impacting the system and obviously to think about climate change. And today, Dr. Schofield is going to share with us his research on the West Antarctic in this Science Cafe, Hot Days in the Southern Ocean. And Oscar, I'll hand it over to you. Great, thanks. So Brian, you can uh, hand over to me to share. Hi everyone, um, let me just get it going. So I thought today, given the fall conditions, uh, we would head down to the Antarctic and I would talk about stuff we're doing there. Um, I got about 20 minutes um, with a lot of imagery, so don't worry, no equations, uh, no graphs. And we're going to talk about the West Antarctic Peninsula. It's located just south of South America. And we've been going down there for 30 years. And even with COVID, we're planning on going next year for our 31st season. And so I'm going to tell you a story about what's happening down there and where it's going. Um, that's my email. If you have questions afterwards, feel free to email me. We're standing here on the Mar Glacier. And you can see an antenna here. And right behind this outcrop of rocks is Palmer Station. It's the US uh, Research Station. I'm standing on this glacier, and this was a year ago. Uh, and the first thing I want to do is just give you a context of how much this place has changed. So the West Antarctic Peninsula is the fastest winter warming place on Earth. And over the last 50 years, winter temperatures have risen by six degrees. And just think of it in your freezer. It's like your ice cream goes from being awesome to not awesome if you raise your freezer by six degrees. Uh, when I started, um, my first trip down was in 1988. Uh, the glacier was all the way to this antenna. So you can see how far the glaciers retreated. On top of it, you can see how this is all modeled. It's dark. And essentially, this uncovered dirt and rock is now blowing onto the glacier and is accelerating the heating. Uh, when I was first down there, it was all covered with snow. Now it's mostly just ice with rivers running through it. So uh, what our project is, is to understand if you melt the sea ice and you melt the glaciers, how does that ripple through the marine food web? And so that's what we've been tracking. When we go down there, we head to Punta Arenas uh, down in southern Chile. It's the biggest sort of port city right on the Straits of Magellan. 
uh, we meet our ship here um, and then head across the Drake. And the Drake, you know, is some of the roughest water in the world. Uh, I'm going to play a video for you of a beautiful sunny day on the Drake. Uh, I'm on the third story of the ship to give you an idea of scale. And I'm about a, on a 250 foot vessel. Um, So that gives you an idea. It's a rough ocean. Um, it's really binary. Sometimes um, it's completely flat. We call it Drake Lake. Um, it's never in between. It's either really pleasant or it's not pleasant. Um, actually, last year was one of the worst storms we hit in it. And despite being on a very powerful vessel, uh, the wind speeds were above 100 miles per hour. And the ship was actually moving background in the way, uh, backwards in the waves. Um, as we travel down, uh, we deploy scientists on the ship as well as Palmer Station. Here's a picture of Palmer Station. And at Palmer Station, uh, the scientists and contractors will work for the entire summer season. So we'll have our science team down there from October, typically until uh, end of March. Uh, we actively engage students in our work. And over the 12 years since um, I've taken over a leadership role in the program. We've had 23 undergraduates come live at Palmer Station, and I got to go to the Antarctic as an undergraduate, um, and it's part of the reason I've done what I've done. And so it's my turn to return the favor. Palmer Station holds about 40 people. And islands uh, via Zodiac, you can see here in the dock. Um, and the Mar Glacier I was talking about is behind all these structures and you can see the antenna there in the distance. So we have teams on the station, we have teams on the ship. I'll give you sort of a little flavor. Uh, here's again the Mar Glacier. I was talking about the sediment blowing up and how icy it is. So here you can see it. This sediment is dark and so when the sun heats it, it acts as a very efficient melter. Um, you get large cracks when you're actually walking on the glacier. Um, one, you have to be careful where you go. Um, the crevasses are getting bigger and the crevasses tend to be a few hundred feet deep. So you don't wanna go there unless you uh, are doing it appropriately. So here we're actually um, climbed down into the glacier. So this is what it looks like inside a glacier. The water, um, the ice has the properties of water. So um, with my flash, it looks green, but when you're down there with just your normal eyes, it looks completely blue. And you can see almost 10 feet into the ice. It's so clear. And that's because of the pressure over thousands of years, all the air bubbles have been pushed out. Um, also, just to point out this crack here, is when you're up on the glacier, um, you can actually hear rivers running through it because it's retreating so quickly. So we're as the glaciers retreated, we've discovered islands we didn't know existed. And so we're working in a place in the world where we're still discovering islands. Um, we get to name them. I don't have one named after me yet, but my uh, former teaching assistant when I was at Santa Barbara got one named after him last year. There's a lot of sea life here. It's a biological hotspot. That's why the penguin colony uh, that's why Palmer Station was built there. Um, it's surrounded by penguin colonies. Um, this is an Adeli penguin with the chick sitting on their nest. They build them out of pebbles. Um, this guy is maybe about 16 to 20 inches tall. Um, there's two Antarctic penguin species that are only found in Antarctica. The Adeli, this one. And the other one is Happy Feet, the emperor penguin. That's further south than where we are. There's a whole host of other seabirds, albatross, um, birds called skuas, which are, um, you can ask me a question about them, but they're kind of like flying aggressive rats. Um, this is a leopard seal. Um, this is probably the most dangerous animal uh, that we face down there. There's occasionally orcas, and of course, they're pretty dangerous too. Um, the leopard seals are very, very aggressive. They're about 
15 feet long, fully grown. Um, and they're just very mean spirited. They eat penguins, they eat other seals, and they do kill humans um, when they get a chance. There was a British diver killed a few years ago, essentially the leopard seal grabbed the diver, pulled it down to 600 feet and just let it go. Um, there are elephant seals, there's fur seals. And part of what we want to understand is as ice melts, um, how does that impact these populations? At Palmer Station, there used to be 18,000 breeding pairs of uh, Adelie penguins. There's about 800 left. And what we're getting are penguin species from South America moving and filling the niche. This is a very healthy chick. The mother and father, they come back to the same location every year. They lay their chicks and they have three months to put four kilograms of fat on the chick. Um, if they don't, it won't survive the winter. Here's the ship we work off of. And just like Palmer Station, we've over um, the last 12 years, have had 33 Rutgers undergraduates take part of these science expeditions. And, um, and it's, uh, it's about 40 people, half crew, half scientists. Um, your birthing area is up here. It's ice reinforced. So we actually do go into the ice fields. This funny contraption up here is your lifeboat. Um, it's covered. It can roll 360 degrees and, uh, you never want to actually be in it. Uh, so this is the Lawrence Gould. The U.S. has two Antarctic vessels um, that it uses to support its research. Um, on board the ship, um, we're outfitted with complete, uh, fully functional laboratories um, that are, you know, allowing us to make uh, measurements as advanced as if we were on uh, campus. Uh, we collect water. We can collect water from as deep as 5,000 meters. Um, this is called a rosette. And you can see these are bottles. And essentially, you computer trigger them based on the data you're seeing to collect water at specific depths. And then you can take the water, go retreat to your lab. Um, this is a penguin. It's, uh, this is actually one of the South American species. This is called a Gen 2 penguin. Um, they only recently have started moving into the Antarctic regions I work in. Uh, we also sample from Zodiac um, to get water. Uh, this point sort of makes the message that the animals down there are not scared of humans. Um, and that's pretty much true of pretty much all the animals, um, from birds to the seals to the whales. Uh, we do all kinds of sampling. We sample from the ship like I showed you before. We do net toes to look for the animals. We go further south of Palmer Station as far as the ice lets us go. And we're at another penguin colony. This is in a place called Avian Island. It has 200,000 breeding, uh, 200,000 penguins, Adelie penguins. Uh, we'll set up camps um, and leave birders there. That'll take them about a week. And they'll census all the birds. They'll weigh all the birds. They'll check the health. Uh, we will sample from Zodiac. Here we are in the ice field. This ice is all brown because it's filled with ice algae. And that's essentially the base of the food web. And then this shows you some incubators. So we will actually do more advanced experiments. We'll fill these with waters and specimens and then do the experiments we need to do. When you're working on a ship, it's a 24 hour operation. Um, and so you pretty much just catch cat naps um, when you've got windows, you know. So the longest you're going to sleep at any given time is four hours um, on a good day. Uh, so whenever I get back home, I find that it takes me about a week to learn how to sleep a normal night. Here's the Antarctic krill, Euphausia superba. You've probably heard about them. Um, you might get. Um, a taste of these guys even up here if you're doing alpha omega-3. They're a few inches uh, long. You can see that they've been eating the algae. Uh, that's my specialty is the algae and the technology. And they'll form super swarms. And these swarms can be 10 miles long, 400 feet thick. And if you hit a super swarm with your nets, you're not going to be able to pull the net back up on the deck because the net will rip. And it's these guys that we consider the keystone of the entire food web. 
seals, whales, fish, birds all rely on this. And there's not too many big meat predators. Um, you know, the, the essentially the two predators are the orcas and the uh, leopard seals. Everybody else is um, really relying on these krill swarms. So they're the sort of real important player and they can survive in big super swarms because there's so much plant growth uh, in the Antarctic during the summertime. We work under all conditions. So here we are working on the back deck on a pretty miserable day, um, collecting uh, mooring. To give you an idea of scale of the waves uh, where this guy is uh, standing, is about 20 feet above the waterline. So, you know, you can work in seas up to 20 feet. We do go into the sea ice zones, uh, kind of panicking. You can see the line going out there. That's because a big piece of ice has caught a piece of equipment. We did get it back. Um, we have gotten frozen in the ice about uh, three years ago. Um, we got stuck for seven days and Earlier in the program in the 2000s, at one point, the entire group was stuck in the ice for a month. There's not much you can do when you're stuck in the ice. The ship will ram, ram, ram. Um, when we were stuck, it ran for 24 hours and we moved in the forward direction about 10 meters. Um, so uh, that's never fun. So we try to avoid that as best as we can, but it happens. What I love about the Antarctic is it is um, absolutely uh, amazing landscapes. You have giant mountains rising right out of the sea. You have dramatic penguin colonies and beautiful blue ocean. And because the atmosphere is so clear, everything looks like it's right on top of you. Um, it is surreal. And it's been one of the gifts of my life to have the opportunity to work down there as much as I do. Uh, we use other technologies to complement the ships. If you've heard of the cool room, you might have heard about the Rutgers gliders. We use those extensively down here. This is essentially a robot. It's about six feet long. It doesn't have a propeller. It flies by changing its weight. Um, and then every few hours it comes to the surface. This is a global cell phone in the tail, that little disc. And that will call home and give the data. So. Uh, during our missions, I'm often calling back to Rutgers main campus in New Brunswick to find out what's going on with the robot because it has a better picture of what's going on around me than um, sometimes I don't do even on the ship. So we deploy fleets of these. We outfit them with all kinds of sensors. So this little compartment here is for science sensors. So if you ever build a science sensor about the size of a bread box, we can take it to sea for you. And the other part that is absolutely amazing down there is the ice um, and the animals. Um, here we are with a nice little tabular iceberg. Here's a very surreal one. They take on all shapes and sizes. The deep blue tells you that it's very old ice. Um, and this old ice is harder than steel. So you got to keep your distance. Remember, with an iceberg, um, the majority of the iceberg is underwater. You're only seeing maybe a fifth of it above the water. So these are giant. Um, we'll often have uh, ice sheet bergy bits fly floating past us that'll be um, four stories tall above the water. And of course the animals, here's an ice fish. Um, it has antifreeze in its blood. So that's how it lives in the cold water. Here's a beautiful crustacean and this is called Limacina. Um, there are a lot of them down there, and it's actually swimming snails. You can kind of see the snail shell there. So there is an, a remarkable array of marine life. There's not much life on the continent. The largest predator on the Antarctic continent is a mite. It's um, maybe a tenth of a millimeter. It's found in the dry valleys. So really all the action around the Antarctic is really in the ocean. Uh, we go to a range of hotspots along. We see different species along the way. Um, this is a specific uh, seal species that lives exclusively on the ice. 
um, it'll birth its young on the ice uh, and nurse it there. Um, the penguins, you'll find them in specific locations. Uh, we think it has to do with how the deep ocean circulates up against the continent. That's some of the science we're looking at. And you'll find huge pods of animals. And I talked about how certain species are moving into it as the Antarctic warms. And elephant seals are a good example. Here you have a big pod of elephant seals. You can smell the pod maybe a mile away. You can hear the pod about a mile away. Um, it usually consists of loud farting and burping. And they pretty much hang out all day there and then occasionally go in the water and go find some krill. We also work on whales. Uh, the whales um, in the Antarctic uh, used to be whaled as part of an industry. They were almost wiped out in the location um, you know, just over 100 years ago. Um, the Antarctic is now a nature preserve and the whales have come back in dramatic fashion. How do you sample a whale? Well, you gotta get close to them. So here are the two whale biologists in the Zodiac. Um, it's pretty uh, intimidating. Uh, the whales will often come play with you and sometimes it'll pop its head out on the front. You can look right in its eye and it'll lift its tail up above you um, on the backside of the Zodiac. Um, this is a picture of whale bubble net feeding. They essentially create these big bubble uh, projections um, and it scares all the krill into a swarm and then they come right up the middle of neat. You can see one here just breaking the surface and another one coming up. Um, when you're in a zodiac uh, you're kind of nervous about this because if you start seeing tiny bubbles uh, breaking around you the only thing you're thinking about is getting out of there because pretty soon a whale is going to be breaking the surface. Um, this picture was taken by drones, so we all use underwater robots, but we use also airborne drones um, to try to look at the ecology of these big animals that we can. not We work internationally, um, so we're the U.S. long-term project. To the north of Palmer Station is an Argentinian-German long-term project, and to the south of us are the United Kingdom scientists, so here we are at the British base. Um, Rothra base. Um, it's about 500 kilometers south of Palmer Station. Uh, it has actually an airfield. It flies people into the interior of the continent. Um, when we're down there, we meet up one day during the cruise. We cross calibrate all our instruments. And then in the late afternoon, we play a soccer game on their runway. Uh, the Brits obviously take their soccer very seriously. And in the 30 years, we've won once with one tie. Um, but then they host a nice party for us in the evening. It's the one evening we don't work in the uh, eight weeks at sea. Um, and so if they win, they're in a better mood and they host us. They often convert some of these labs in it. Um, and so here's a nice sunset at Rothra after the soccer game. Um, temperatures along the peninsula range um, from in the summertime uh, right around freezing to about maybe minus 10 down at Rothra you're usually around minus five. I just looked online before this talk started Palmer stations at minus five today but what really gets you in this location is the wind. Um, there have been some years where the average wind speed the entire summer is about 35 miles per hour winds. So you can imagine it's the wind chill um, that not only really gets the sea going uh, roughly, but also um, really makes it difficult and uncomfortable to work. And so some people, you know, often wonder what life is like at sea. Here you can see the silhouette of the, our ship on an iceberg as we pass by. Um, it's pretty much a 24 hour operation. Uh, because of that, there are uh, cooks working full time. They cook four full meals a day. Um, so if you're not careful, you're not losing weight down there. Um, and essentially, we run a grid of stations. And so if we reach a station, work starts regardless of if you've had a break or not. Um, 
This is my little office I set up on the cruise. You can see this wood here. It's screwed into the bench so that when the ship is rolling, my computer doesn't go flying. Um, so you're pretty much, if you're not sampling, you're analyzing the data. We do have some fun things. We have an annual cribbage tournament. Cribbage is a classic old nautical card game um, you play on chips. And here I am painting the trophy of it. It's a cribbage board that the winner gets to take. Uh, you do have showers, but you tend not to worry too much about looking good because it's pretty much just a nerd, nerd fest. Um, and when you're not working and you're not in a computer, you're out and enjoying the imagery. And so um, that was sort of a quick synopsis of sort of what it's like to be to see. And then I thought it'd be fun if people had questions. Um, we could talk through that if you want. So I will stop sharing the screen and take questions. So Oscar, I, and uh, this is Mary, I have a couple of questions for you. I'm sure more will come in. Um, okay. Nolan wanted to know, does the ice algae bloom around the same time as the phytoplankton and how are they physiologically different? Um, yeah, that is a great question. Um, there's a long standing idea that the ice algae, um, they grow in the bottom of the ice. And so if you get under the ice and you sort of feel the bottom of the ice, um, it feels spongy and it's dark brown full of algae. And so um, when the ice melts back, um, what you see is the ice algae are released into the ocean. And so there's a long standing idea that the ice algae actually seed the spring bloom of phytoplankton. Um, but if you look at the species, the spring bloom tends to be different species. Uh, the ice algae is um, really well suited to grow in darkness. Um, it's not, what we do think happens is when you melt all that ice on the surface ocean, it's fresh and it helps confine the mixing so they're not mixing as deep. And then the phytoplankton get plenty of light, and we think that's what triggers the spring bloom. So then, a follow-up question to some degree from some from Atasola is: What are the ice algae called? Um, there's many different species of ice algae. Um, there's diatoms, there's dinoflagellates. Um, so you have a bunch of um, different species that live in the ice, and the way they end up associated with the ice is when ice forms in winter it forms is crystals in the water column and then floats up and as it's floating up it's scavenging algae out of the water all not all the algae who reach the ice are going to survive the winter it's going to be those species that are really well suited to that um, and so it's really really diverse um, assemblage of not only algae but um, small grazers and small animals and they they're almost living in like an ice desert because there's very little food um and very little nutrients to grow on um but they make a living that way so charette wanted to, she made a comment over the fact that she didn't see any heavy coats and she was wanted to know the temperature which i think you talked about but i'm gonna take her question and stretch a little bit and ask yeah you. no so um <laughs> when you first get down there you're cold um when we uh, are in Chile, um, you're issued a, a duffel bag of essentially winter gear. Um, and the winter gear is, you know, jackets, parkas, um, Sorel boots. Um, so what you would wear um, during a real cold winter here is typical. The ship is heated, so um, I believe in the layer effect. And when you work on the back deck, you have to wear um, exposure suits. Um, what I find though is after a few weeks, um, I don't know if it's because my family is originally Swedish, but my blood starts to thicken. And so then I can work out on the back deck with a life jacket, um, long underwear and my Hawaiian shirt and um, I'll be fine. Um, again, it's usually the wind that really determines how much you need to uh, sort of buckle up. The real cold temperatures of Antarctica happen inland. Because we are on the ocean, the ocean really modifies the temperature swings and keeps us more at the zero to 
minus 10. And then sometimes, like last year, there were those Ladar circumstances where we, uh, right where we were working, it was 70 degrees. And, uh, you know, that doesn't happen very often. It's happening more frequently, um, but it's sort of a weird weather event. So Anasala asked another question. She wanted to know what the most dangerous species was and what makes them dangerous. Um, the leopard seal, well, I mean, the orcas, I've only seen them. They usually hang off at a distance. Um, we've been chased ashore um, in our zodiacs um, by orcas. And so that, if they got us, I assumed that um, we'd be, we would have been in trouble. I've seen the orcas. Um, go after seals and they'll hunt as a pack and they will dislodge the seals from the ice and it's a very uh, much more like into one um, they will come up onto Palmer station um, and to give you an idea that they will um, sharpen their teeth on the zodiacs you'll walk out and they will have punctured the zodiacs they'll chase our boats um, the one sort of graphic situation I saw myself in once, I was actually on the station drinking a morning cup of coffee. It was a sort of a sunrise at 3 a.m. It was beautiful. There was a penguin, an ice flow right in front of us. And I was just sitting there going, ah, oh, I'm looking at the face of God. And right then a leopard seal leapt up on the ice flow, ripped it to pieces, got back in the water, didn't eat it and swam away. And so for the rest of the day, we had this sort of Texas chainsaw massacre ice flow right in front of us the whole time. Um, they do attack humans and they're very big and they're very, very strong. And so leopard seals are what I'm most nervous about. Hey, we're gonna change direction a little bit here and ask from Gayatri, do you do any work with ocean acidification? And if yes, what concerns does acidification pose for the specific marine life in the Antarctic? Yeah, so um, actually we do do a lot of ocean acidification work. Um, so ocean acidification is where the pH of the ocean is decreasing because the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is going in. Um, and what we find um, is that the Antarctic is actually um, showing pretty dramatic changes in pH. And many of the animals, um, build calcium carbonate shells. And so uh, the example of the sea snail is a good one. Um, it is going to be dramatically impacted because the more acidic water will dissolve the calcium carbonate shells. So uh, there's no um, single response to ocean acidification. It bothers some species, but not others. And so we're slowly going through and testing the individual species. And then we're building specialized mathematical models to give us an idea of when the future uh, pH is going to reach certain levels. Is it 20 years from now? Is it 50 years from now? So then that, that way we can sort of track, do we see species composition changing because of the changing pH? I didn't unmute myself there. I apologize. Uh, question from Prudence. If the ice caps melt, how long will humans be able to survive? Humans will, um, what, what the ice cap melting will do, um, it, we will feel it as humans by as sea level rise. Because a lot of this ice has uh, been there for a long, long time. Not so much sea ice. Sea ice grows in winter. Um, and then melts in summer. So um, that's not going to do it, but it's the glaciers and the ice sheets that'll do it. So just south of us is Pine Island Glacier and the Amundsen Ice Sheet. Um, that is in runaway collapse. And what that means is the deep ocean, which is warm, has gotten underneath. And so that ice sheet will collapse. We don't know whether that's going to take 50 years or 500 years, but just that one ice sheet um represents uh six inches of sea level rise um and if you think about new jersey and manhattan 
um, that is a mammoth sea level rise. We're talking usually now, um, you know, way less than a centimeter a year. And the Antarctic, um, the sea level rise we're going to see will be from the Antarctic. Um, and it's sort of a geophysical reason for that. Um, so the thing that's going to be really um, affected by it are coastal communities and coastal towns and coastal cities. And um, we obviously are one of those coastal towns. But if you look around the world, uh, I think it's 10 of the 13 megacities of the planet are all located at the coast. And so a huge majority of humanity will be forced to either live with the sea level or retreat from it. Um, and once an ice sheet starts collapsing, um, that train has left the station. So we will see dramatic sea level rise from these locations. We just don't, the big science question now that there's a lot of work on is um, when? Thanks, Oscar. Uh, next question is, how much evidence of humans do you see in the West Antarctic, like trash or pollution? We do see some, it's still incredibly pristine. Um, and sort of the human signal that is most, um, sort of you can chase down are certain chemicals um, and atmospheric signals. Um, this, uh, you know, one good example is um, ozone. So my early work in my career was on the ozone hole and how essentially the biology sunburned under the ozone hole and was it important. And so that was from CFCs we'd put up in the atmosphere. Um, there is a giant um, tourist industry for this location. Um, they, the tourist industry is actually extremely responsible because they know that people are coming to see an incredibly pristine uh, place and it's the most accessible place to the Antarctic to get to. And so you will see, um, you know, uh, ships down there, um, but they're very regulated. Uh, we do see some plastic, this, that, but that is pretty rare. Um, there are some lone explorers down there. So you don't know, did that plastic come from far away or was there an irresponsible person? But for the most part, it looks probably um, like it did thousands of years ago. Um, lots of icebergs, glaciers, and a lot of the sea ice crowded up on the uh, islands. So Nick wanted to know um, whether you encountered any precipitation on your trips since you were in a warmer sector of Antarctica. Yeah, so um, we actually are seeing more and more rain. So Palmer Station is sort of right at the boundary. Um, so if you go south of us, it's still a true polar climate and it's drier. If you go north of us, it's become much wetter. And one of the things that's uh, affecting the Adelie penguins is the precipitation. Um, when they build their nests, they tend to build them in gullies. Um, they never really thought about rain. And now we're getting more and more rain. And when it rains, there's runoff. And a lot of times the nests are built where the water will pool and the eggs will drown. And sometimes if it's a very wet year, you will get a 100% um, failure that particular year because the penguins live for a while, um, almost a decade or more. Um, it doesn't mean that the colony disappears. It means just that year wasn't very fruitful. Last year was probably the warmest year I'd ever experienced in my career down there. Um, and we were pretty far south and it was raining and it kind of freaked us out because you don't see rain. So, and I apologize if I pronounce your name incorrectly, it looked like Karandashini asked, how long did it take to mentally adapt to being in the Antarctic environment and what were the biggest challenges? Um, you know, it, for these trips, I'm usually down there for two months. I teach in the fall and I teach in the spring. And so um, it's for the people who are down there from anywhere from two to seven months. I've been down there for seven months. Um, and the biggest adjustments are obviously you're away from your family. Um, the other thing is you're living in very close confines, whether it's on the station or on the ship. Um, and so the worst 
situation is where um, people start getting into a conflict because they can magnify very quickly. Uh, back in the early days in the 70s, there was an incident at Palmer Station where the uh, cook had tried, uh, it was the doctor had tried to poison the cook. The doctor had gone a little crazy. Um, now, if you're down there for those long stretches of time, you have to take a psychological exam after those incidents. Um, but other than that, um, I find that you're working around the clock. Um, now there's email, um, so you can write home, work can find you on the ship, and global phones allow you to call home every day. And so that helps a lot. So not, a, not directly a follow-up from the same person, but a question was posted that with the recent information coming out that there were numerous sexual harassment complaints and sexist policies on the Mosaic Arctic Research Vessel. What is being done in your research group to get more inclusive? Yeah, so um, one thing uh, we've always had is sort of a very strict policy of inclusion. Um, a lot of the worst cases of harassment, at least in the Antarctic, often occur in remote field camps um, on the ship. And ever since I've been going down, my first trip was late 80s. It's been 50% men and women uh, for the most part. The British, on the other hand, they only became integrated uh, gender wise um, probably um, 15 years ago. Uh, so the US has been a leader like that. And then the other thing you have to do is um, before we leave the docks, um, there's actual harassment training, safety training that everyone repeats every year. And um, there's a series of different contact people on the ship, um, whether it's medics, chief scientists like myself um, that are monitoring the situation. Um, it's something we always worry about, uh, but we've developed a good culture at, for our community um, to make sure it feels safe, inclusive, and friendly. And uh, but, you know, that's the responsibility. You have to make sure you create that culture. So, Jesse, first of all, thank you for a great presentation and asked, has the abundance of krill changed in recent decades due to climate change? And I'm going to add that to that a general question about over time, have the animal populations decreased? Yeah, so um, krill, if you go north of the peninsula, just north of the peninsula, the krill seem to have de declined up there. Um, it appears they're moving south. Um, we haven't seen a statistically uh, significant trend yet in declining uh, krill. Um, but what we think is happening is you're getting like a climate gradient. To the north is like the new condition. And then that's slowly migrating southward. And so the question we have is when we will see um, the krill start showing declines because they're really dependent on um, ice to essentially um, have their larval uh, sort of get through their teenage years eating on those ice algae and other critters. Um, so I think that we predict we'll see the change. We haven't seen it. Um, the other changes, what you find are there are certain species that are ice tolerant, those are the ones that usually come from the north. They don't really, really like the ice, but they can handle it. And then those, there are those that are absolutely uh, dependent on the ice. And it's those ice dependent species. So for whales, the humpbacks are going up, but the minke whales are ice dependent. Those populations don't seem to be growing. Um, they're very hard to sample, they're very nervous. So you don't get close to them very often. Um, the Adelis um, are definitely uh, showing trends. Um, and then, but it doesn't mean life dies. It's these new sort of other species moving in that are filling the niche. So one of our guests asked uh, if you could say more about the warming trends. Uh, what are the measurement and record keeping for temperature and other climatic trends? And are they largely automated and year round? 
Yeah, so actually they have been automated for atmospheric temperature, water temperature. That's pretty automated. Um, our records go back to the early 1950s. Um, and we have, um, if you go to the peninsula, uh, there's about 20 different nations that work there. They all have their own field stations. And pretty much all of them are measuring and sharing data. Um, there's pretty good wind records. Um, uh, atmospheric temperature since the, uh, you know, early 80s, uh, UV index for ozone depletion, um, pretty much those. Now what is being automated slowly with the robots and other technologies is a lot of the parts of the ocean you can't measure next to a station. If you're working at a field station, you're only allowed to go about one nautical mile from the station for safety reasons. Um, and so you're not really capturing a big snapshot. And on top of it, ships are not in great abundance. Um, and so uh, we can't maintain a presence. And so the robotic systems, they measure everything from the physics, temperature, uh, mixing, they measure chemistry, oxygen, they can measure nitrogen, they can measure ocean acidification, um, and they can measure biology. We can look at the color of the water, tell us what kind of plants are growing, how much. We can use acoustics to look at the krill number. You can use passive listening systems to listen for whale call. And so what we're in the process of doing now is trying to build those fleets of robots so we can measure all year round. Um, it's probably still a few years off, but we're getting closer. So we've got just three more questions, Oscar. What's your favorite animal to study, observe, and why? Um, well, I, I'm an algae guy by training. Um, so intellectually, um, I love the algae, but I have to say that um, down there, the uh, penguins, are just ridiculously fun to look at. In the water, like my very first slide, they're like torpedoes. On land, they look incredibly clumsy and have a hard time moving around. And they have a lot of attitude. Um, they will, uh, if they think you're annoying, they will try to chase you away. And I'm 6'2", and uh, that 20-inch penguin will have none of it. Another fun animal down there um, that's showing up are more fur seals. They look kind of like a flippered dog, um, and they play a game of chicken with you. They'll sort of charge, and if you back, um, they'll continue to charge, but if you take a step forward, they'll stop. Um, the one thing about the Antarctic, it's, an, it's a preserve for science, and so there are very strict rules on how you can interact with the animals. And really, we spend most of our time making sure we don't change their behavior. Um, so we're sort of passive watchers of the fauna. But it's spectacular, and um, it's right there. So Prudence wanted to know whether the melting of the glaciers will increase temperatures as well. Um, it won't really um, do that. The water that comes off the glacier is usually pretty cold. What's melting this location, so I said the winter temperatures are getting warmer. The only thing that has enough heat to warm those winter temperatures as much as we've seen is the deep ocean. The deep ocean is about four degrees Celsius. And where the Antarctic is melting is where the deep ocean is closest to the land. So it upwells the heat. So it's the deep ocean um, being pushed by wind that's bubbling heat up to the atmosphere and melting it. Um, and if you shut down carbon release to the atmosphere today, there's enough heat built up in the deep ocean where it'll continue to melt for up to 150 years, something on that order. Um, so we're going to continue to see melt. Um, what we see with the glaciers melting is that's what's going to contribute to the sea level rise here. Um, and it also releases lots of uh, chemistry that might favor different types of algae and different types of species. And so that's part of the science of trying to figure that out. OK, 
Okay, Oscar, we're going to a uh, final question from Gayatri is how do you deal with constantly learning and seeing the effects of climate change mentally? How do you stay hopeful and positive? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, the science part of me, you just focus on the science. And so you, you become extremely curious about the changes. In my life, I've been able to watch a whole ecosystem and ocean change, which is pretty amazing. Um, if you think of forests and climate change, that's something that takes decades to centuries, and I'm watching it over years to decades. Um, as a human, um, you know, what I know is uh, we're going to have sea level change, um, that even if we changed everything today, we would have a continued presence. But I'm still an optimist because I believe as people find out what's happening, um, they will uh, take it seriously. And the thing that makes me hopeful is politicians um, on both sides can be very aggressive. But if you go to large institutions um, like the Department of Defense, climate change is in their top five of national security threats. Um, and that's a big conservative institution. Uh, the reason is, is you're going to change where rain falls and where food will be grown and you will lead to mass migration. And a lot of the migration we see from Syria and those locations was predicted by climate scientists 20, 30 years ago. And so my hope is, is we can develop a consensus. There's no scientific debate really about it's happening. It's a policy debate about what we should do about it. Well, Oscar, thank you very, very much for all these answers to these questions. And of course, for your presentation. Um, I'd like to um, thank everyone for joining us today. Brian, if you can just let me share one slide very quickly and then I'll hand it back to you. Shut the ball. I got it. Thank you. So I just wanted to remind everybody that this is the first in uh, a series this fall. We also have a series of, of slides of slides. <laughs> we have a series of seminar in the spring. You're welcome to join them. Um, our next one is Dr. Donald Schaffner, who's going to be speaking about COVID-19 on October 13th, also 11.30. And then on November 17th, Dr. Frank Gallagher will talk about native or non-native plants. If you would like to ask more questions, Oscar has given you his email, which is here on the slide. And if you want more information about future talks, please go to sciencecafesebs.rutgers.edu slash sciencecafes. Okay, thank you. And thank you again for everyone for joining us. Brian? Yeah, uh, thanks so much, Mary. Thanks, Oscar. That was great. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, when you leave the uh, presentation, a pop-up survey will appear. If you could just fill that out for us, that'll help us uh, moving forward with our programming, uh, ways to improve it. So thank you very much. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you, everyone.